All right, welcome everybody. It is now one o'clock, so we will get started with our webinar. Thanks to everyone for taking the time to join us today. We are excited to have Ray Newman from University of Minnesota and Ryan Toom from Montana State University to share some information about their research with hybrid water mill foil. Um, I, I, I'm sorry for anyone who might who had troubles joining. We had a, a Zoom security update and it required the use of a password. So it, it, it made um, either is making you enter a password or change your link to join. You should have gotten some updated emails with those links in them. So we'll, um, I'll talk for a little bit and hopefully that'll give time for anyone else who might be um, having troubles with that quick change um, time to join before Ray and Ryan start talking. I'll give a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first, my name is Megan Weber. I am an extension educator here at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Um, Pat Mulcahy is also here. He is helping out with any tech issues. Um, Pat is a part of our program team. He's our program coordinator. If you need help, feel free to chat him in the chat box, or you can email him if you're having issues within Zoom. And his email is mulcahyp at umn.edu. Um, we will be recording this webinar. So you can find that on our YouTube channel once we've gotten a chance to do the closed captions on that. It takes usually about a week to get that up and going. Um, and all of you will be will remain on mute for the duration of the webinar. If you do have questions, you can use the chat. Um, you should be able to see that in the little bar below the little chat. It's circled on your screen right now. Um, go ahead and type your questions there. We'll be tracking them and we'll, we'll um, ask those to Ray and Ryan at the completion of their presentation. Finally, um, I'm sure you'll notice that there are subtitles showing up on the bottom of the screen. If uh, you would prefer to not see those, there should be a live transcript button on your bottom bar. And if you click that, there's an option to hide subtitles. So that will remove those from you. Um, so with that, I think that's all that I have for our housekeeping items. Um, so I'm going to turn the presentation over to uh, Ray. Ray is going to start out the chat and I'll let him introduce himself as, as he joins in. Okay, thank you, Megan. Let me see if I can. Get my screen shared. <clears throat> so, hope that looks all right for everyone. And let's see here. Okay, so, um, right, I'm going to give you uh, sort of the latest on hybrid water milfoil in Minnesota. And I'll just uh, uh, mention for our team. Um, I'm sort of leading the sampling here in Minnesota and our, our efforts assessing uh, populations. And Ryan Thum is a milfoil uh, genetics expert and he's at Montana State. So he does all the genetic analysis and he's done extensive work in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin also. Uh, Jasmine Eltawili is a graduate student from Water Resources on the project and uh, she's contributed uh, some data analysis and slides and so on to our presentation. So, um, what <clears throat> Eurasian water milfoil uh, was introduced to North America from Eurasia in the 1940s. Uh, it first showed up in Minnesota in 1987 in uh, Lake Minnetonka. It forms these uh, extensive surface mats you can see here uh, that end up shading out uh, native plants and also makes it a real difficulty to end up getting through for boating and swimming. Eurasian water milfoil is present in more than 350 lakes in Minnesota. These black dots are the lakes that have known infestations of Eurasian water milfoil. And um, I should point out at this time that uh, this is invasive water milfoil, so it can, could can include pure Eurasian water milfoil or also hybrid water milfoil. So because it's so difficult to distinguish those, the DNR doesn't separate them out. So they're both considered invasive and end up being listed as uh, Eurasian water milfoil. Now there's a native water milfoil, northern water milfoil, that's widespread in Minnesota. Um, prior to the introduction of Eurasian water milfoil, it was probably the most often controlled and permitted aquatic plant in the state. But it can be outcompeted by Eurasian water milfoil, particularly in deeper water or poor water clarity conditions, 
And actually, in a number of lakes, uh, northern water milfoil has disappeared since uh, Eurasian has invaded. So both Eurasian and northern are closely related. Actually, in the 1950s, northern water milfoil was considered a subspecies of Eurasian water milfoil. Both of these uh, primarily uh, reproduce by uh, vegetative or clonal uh, reproduction. So they can fragment, auto fragment, or you can break off pieces, they'll reroute and end up uh, uh, producing colonies, but they both do reproduce sexually. So they produce seeds uh, that are viable and uh, will end up uh, starting new populations from seedlings. The Eurasian and Northern water milfoil can interbreed. And when they do, then they're forming hybrids. Uh, Interestingly, these hybrids also reproduce sexually. Uh, so hybrid can reproduce with another hybrid or hybrid could also back cross with Eurasian or with uh, Northern, the other parental type. But hybrids also reproduce uh, vegetatively. So again, clonal spread is probably important uh, both within the lake uh, from uh, auto fragmentation and so on, and then also among lakes uh, via trailers and birds and whatnot. It's difficult to distinguish these water milfoil taxa. Uh, the way that's most typically used are looking at leaflets or these pinnae. And you can see Eurasian water milfoil, the pinnae are uh, closely uh, spaced together and there tend to be a lot of them, tw typically 12 to 20 leaflet pairs uh, uh, on a side here. Uh, Northern water milfoil has much more widely spaced pinnae, uh, typically five to 11 leaflet pairs. Hybrid ends up being intermediate. Uh, typically 10 to 13 leaflet pairs, but actually from 17, seven to 19 leaflet pairs have been seen. So it's possible. So you can see with this, there's incredible overlap and you really can't tell if you've got a plant, what you've got, unless you end up using genetic analysis. So uh, we've been using genetic analysis uh, now based on microsatellites to positively identify which taxon we're dealing with. So why should we worry about hybrid water milfoil? Um, hybrid could be more vigorous or invasive than uh, Eurasian water milfoil, might grow faster, be a better competitor. So that's a real concern. You can end up getting hybrid vigor. Hybrids could also be resistant to or tolerant of herbicides or biological control agents. Uh, we previously did some work with biological control agents and their response to hybrid is sort of intermediate between Eurasian and Northern water milfoil. And at the moment does not appear to be a big problem uh, that hybrid poses for uh, biocontrol agents. However, there's a lot of evidence for increased tolerance and resistance to herbicides in some populations or some genotypes of hybrid water milfoil. So there are uh, populations or genotypes that are resistant to 2,4-D, others that are resistant to triclopyr. These are both oxen mimics. And there are separate genotypes that appear to be uh, resistant to Florida. So this is a real concern. Our management could be selecting for resistant or tolerant genotypes. And then this could result in it being much more difficult to control uh, the plants and require higher doses with our conventional herbicides. And this could also result in more collateral damage uh, to our native plant communities. It's often based on dose relationships. So our work in Minnesota um, was funded uh, by MACERC and, and LCCMR was aimed at describing the frequency of occurrence and the geographic distribution of hybrid water milfoil in Minnesota and relate it to environmental and management factors. Now in doing this, we're also gonna be describing the distribution of Eurasian water milfoil specifically, and then also uh, Northern water milfoil. We also want to delineate and quantify the genetic variation in hybrid Eurasian and Northern water milfoil. Are these plants all the same sort of clonally being reproduced or is there a lot of genetic diversity that could end up having some potential for either invasiveness or tolerance uh, to herbicides? And then we want to assess the response of these taxa and uh, particularly hybrid, but specific genotypes of hybrid to management in a small subset of lakes. So we've got about a dozen lakes that we're studying, seven of them that are being managed, managed with herbicides and five reference lakes. That should lead us to identify potentially problematic genotypes for further testing. So the aim here is we can go out and now uh, try these in the lab with various herbicides and see if indeed that particular genotype is resistant to a particular herbicide. 
So for characterizing the distribution, we originally um, sampled in 62 lakes, and then last year in 2019, we were able to pick up some additional lakes. So now we've got information from over 70 lakes throughout the state. Um, and we selected these uh, based on their proportional occurrence. So we uh, sampled in the metro more because that's where uh, more of the infestations occur. Uh, but we also have samples from these uh, outstate regions to be able to characterize uh, what is in those lakes. We went to those lakes, we collected plants, on a sort of a stratified basis, and we were able to get genetic identifications and on our sample. So we know uh, exactly what taxa they are and uh, what genotype we have in those lakes. So this is our current knowledge of hybrid distribution in Minnesota. Uh, we've got 46 lakes that have Eurasian water milfoil, 36 that have hybrid water milfoil, and 27 uh, with northern water milfoil. And you can see here the blue uh, circles, blue pies, uh, end up representing northern water milfoil, and it's primarily found in the outstate, and it's really underrepresented in this metro area. In contrast, um, hybrid water milfoil in the yellow uh, uh, circles uh, ends up being concentrated in the metro, and there are much fewer populations of hybrid water milfoil outstate. Eurasian water milfoil in these red circles is fairly evenly distributed, at least based on the proportion of lakes that have uh, uh, invasive milfoil in them. You can see both in the metro area and in our outstate lakes. And this is a significant difference in the distribution, this concentration of hybrid in the metro. Now, if we look at taxa within those lakes, actually, uh, most of the lakes, uh, 33, only have one taxa present. So this is sort of the same distribution map, but now I've sort of spread out the lakes so they're not overlapping each other. So this is an exact representation of where they are. But you can see uh, that, uh, for example, these yellow circles that don't have any other color within them are lakes that have pure hybrid. So uh, there's a fair number of lakes that only have hybrid water milfoil. In the red, you can see lakes that only have Eurasian water milfoil. But we do have lakes with mixed number of taxon. Probably the uh, most common is Eurasian water milfoil and northern water milfoil with the potential to generate hybrids. Uh, but we do have five lakes that have all three taxa present. Now, I'll just mention at this point to end up forming hybrid water milfoil, at some point you'd need to have all three taxa present. The two parent taxa, Eurasian water milfoil and northern water milfoil, they would interbreed to produce hybrid water milfoil. So what's happening is in some of these lakes, we're losing the parental taxa. Either they've gone extinct in those lakes or they're just at a low enough frequency that we cannot detect them. And hybrid, for example, has become uh, dominant or more common in those lakes. So one thing that Jasmine did for her uh, master's thesis was assess the factors that were related to the occurrence of these uh, taxa across the lake. So Eurasian, Northern, and hybrid water milfoil. So she looked at the age of infestation. Has this been infested since the late 1980s or just in the past three or four years? So we had uh, three different categories or age of infestation we looked at. She also looked at the distance from the nearest infestations, so are these clustered close by or further apart? And a set of environmental variables like lake size, depth, secchi depth, and trophic state index. She also looked at sort of propagule pressure or uh, how many access parking spaces were on a lake. So is there more hybrid in lakes that end up having uh, more uh, boating visitors to that lake? And lastly, we looked at management history. So uh, we rated in, in cooperation with the DNR, uh, lake management histories on these lakes, if they weren't treated at all or very limited treatment for Eurasian water milfoil, they get a low score. If they had repeated intensive treatment, they get a high score. And so then we assessed the occurrence based on this management history. Turns out that the really primary significant factor were that hybrids tend to be in the metro and they're not uh, as near as common in the outstate. There's no effective age of infestation. We're a little surprised at this. Infestations in the metro are older and closer together than outstate. But when you look at the taxa, there's no uh, difference. So there wasn't a, an effect on hybrid occurrence based on age of infestation or uh, how close they were proximity. None of the environmental variables uh, were significant for either Eurasian water milfoil or hybrid water milfoil. There's a few significances for uh, northern water milfoil. And 
there is no effective access or parking space. So no difference, hybrid wasn't more common in places that had uh, more accesses. And finally, we had no evidence that management history was important. So there's no difference in the occurrence of, uh, say, hybrid water melt foil, whether it was intensively managed or are not intensively managed. So at the moment, we don't have clear evidence uh, that management is promoting hybrids in Minnesota, although there's probably evidence elsewhere that this is happening. So the next thing we wanted to look at is hybrid genotyping. So in other words, uh, what is the, the genetic structure here? Are these uh, uh, from the same parents or are they totally unrelated? So we can use that information to determine the genetic diversity of the water mill files that are present and determine if there's differences in diversity among the taxa or geographic settings. So is hybrid more or less diverse than uh, say Eurasian water mill foil. And lastly, along with this, once we end up identifying genotypes, so now we're no longer looking at this broad taxonomic distribution, we're sort of looking at characters, say from a family, are you tolerant to that herbicide? So we can start to identify potentially problematic genotypes. So for Eurasian water mill foil, we only found seven genotypes. And there was one that was widespread. That was the one that was common in, in most of our lakes. Almost all of our lakes had this one uh, that had Eurasian water mill foil, this one widespread genotype. There were four lakes that did have more than one genotype in it, but uh, not a lot of diversity in Eurasian water mill foil. In contrast, the native northern water mill foil had 96 genotypes. Every lake had a different genotype. So uh, there wasn't a genotype that was clonally spread to any other lake. They were all different. And typically, lakes had multiple genotypes. So this suggests that there's a fair bit of reduction reproduction, although this is occurring over a long term, maybe thousands of years, uh, that northern water milfoil has generated uh, diversity in these lakes. Hybrid water milfoil, again, is intermediate. Where we found 61 genotypes. Most of the lakes only had one unique genotype that was found nowhere else, so probably had to be derived in that lake or some nearby lake that we haven't sampled yet. Uh, 14 lakes, though, did have multiple genotypes. And interestingly, in Minnetonka, uh, the bays, three bays, had five or more genotypes each, and several of those bays also had Eurasian water mill foil. Now, we did find five hybrid genotypes in multiple lakes. So one of them was found in 10 lakes, and, and uh, two, it's actually more than two, I think five found in two lakes. So this is our genotype distribution of Eurasian water mill foil among lakes. And so you can see, ooh, sorry about that. You can see um, with these green um, circles, this is this widespread E1 genotype of Eurasian water mill foil. So it's widely spread across the state. There are a few other genotypes that occur in just individual lakes here that are around, but there's not a big structure in Eurasian water mill foil. So this Eurasian water mill foil, pure Eurasian water mill foil has been clonally spread around to all of these lakes. In contrast, Hybrid water milfoil um, has uh, mostly distributed within the metro area, but you can see these genotypes are distributed all over the place, right? And uh, some genotypes are shared among lakes, uh, but it's also not clear to us with all these genotypes, any particular pattern or structure. We'll look at a few of these that are shared in a bit more detail. Uh, and the next slide here, if we look at these shared genotypes, you can see this one genotype H1 is shared across a number of lakes. And originally we thought this was maybe a primarily East Metro group, but with our additional sampling, we picked it out up in Wright County also. So several of these lakes, Bald Eagle, Otter, White Bear, may end up being connected water connections and they go into Josephine. Uh, so there's a possibility of those being sort of uh, distributed by flow, but these other lakes are totally independent. So they have to be uh, being populated here by either human transport on trailers or lake uh, service providers or someone, or perhaps bird migratory pathway. But these are clonal spread. These are all identical. They had to be formed in some lake. We don't know which the original source is and now move to those lakes. Um, you can see that we've got another genotype here that's in Coon and Elmo. Again, those are uh, widely distributed, not in the same watershed, a set of lakes in Dakota County with some interesting going on. That's probably local movement of canoes and so on across there and some waterway connections. And then, as I mentioned, in Minnetonka, we're sharing genotypes across those uh, bays. So we've got clearly some instances of uh, 
clonal spread in hybrid water mill file. And if you remember back to the Eurasian water mill file, almost all the Eurasian water mill file has been clonally spread across to other lakes. So for our ongoing work on this project, we're assessing the response of Eurasian and hybrid water mill file to herbicide treatments. Uh, with those studies, we're going to try to follow changes in populations over time. So we get pre and post herbicide treatment distribution of genotypes within the lake. And then we can look at those changes over multiple years of treatment and with the aim of identifying problematic genotypes. And then once, once we do that, we'll end up taking these into the laboratory, a few of these genotypes and end up dosing them with different uh, herbicides and see if they happen to be uh, resistant to particular uh, herbicides. And that will allow us to determine that say genotype X uh, doesn't respond well to fluoridone, which probably is not what you want to use to control that. So in summary, hybrid water mill file is quite widespread around the state, but it is much more common in the metro. Uh, Eurasian water milfoil is spread widespread throughout the state. There's no difference in uh, occurrence of these based on duration of infestation, a lot of these attributes, uh, boat access and management history. The hybrid populations are closer together and they're sort of concentrated in the metro, but this may be a largely a function of that's where our infestations first started out and where the greatest initial spread was uh, with time to develop hybrids. The parent taxa don't need to be present in a lake to find hybrid water milfoil, but the fact that most of our lakes only have a single a hybrid that's only found in that lake suggests that this was produced from in situ reproduction. So that seems to be important. Eurasian has real limited diversity, Northern's very diverse, and hybrid is genetically diverse. But again, as I mentioned, most lakes only have one genotype. So at least in those lakes, you don't have to worry about selecting for a different genotype. Your genotype may be problematic, but there isn't another genotype to work with. Some of this human dispersal is important. We need to think about uh, that, but there are lots of unique genotypes that are there. So as I mentioned, our future work, we're going to try to identify these problematic genotypes. Uh, if you're interested in more on our previous work, we've got a map that shows the distribution as of 2018. We'll update it fairly soon with our 2019 results of Eurasian hybrid and northern uh, that we've genetically identified in the state. And our project report on our previous project is available at this website. So I guess with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan, who's going to address short and long term approaches to using genetic markers to inform uh, best management practices for Eurasian and hybrid water milfoil. Okay, thanks, Ray. Um, let me share my screen here. Hopefully you're seeing what I'm seeing. Um, so with, with Ray's background, and I'll shut my video off here as well so we can save some bandwidth and spare you the, spare you looking at me. See how do I shut that off? I don't know. Um, so with that background from, from Ray um, and summary of what we're doing in Minnesota, uh, I wanted to just take a step back and um, give a broader context for where we're going, what we're trying to accomplish in terms of using uh, genetic tools to help inform management uh, decisions and outcomes. Give me a second here. I apologize for being a little slow on this. All right, so hopefully everybody can see. I can't see the chat anymore, so I don't know if I'm You're good, Ryan. We can see Am your I good? Okay, great. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate it. Yeah, let's sort of work stabbing in the dark here. So, um, okay. So the basic premise of all this work is that genetic variation can influence management outcomes. So we know that there's different strains of water milfoil out there, and it stands to reason that some of those strains may grow and respond differently to different herbicides uh, from one another. And so in the worst cases, uh, an herbicide is ineffective in a particular lake because that lake is dominated by uh, strain, one or more strains of milfoil that are resistant to that particular herbicide. And so um, our, our, we basically posit that genetic information can therefore be used to predict management response of target populations and improve management outcomes. So right now we're sort of managing water milfoil populations blind to genetic diversity. And uh, we posit that if we understand something about that genetic diversity, we can improve management outcomes. 
So this is a very long um, research program. So I, I divide uh, the way we're approaching this problem into sort of short term. What I mean by that is what we, what we can do right away now and over the next several years. Um, and then a long term approach, which is more of a sort of five to 10 plus year um, horizon, but that will really um, improve things a whole lot. So in the short term, what we're looking to do is build what we call a catalog of herbicide responses for prioritized genotypes. And I'll show you a lot more about what I mean about that. And then in the long term, we're looking to identify the actual genes involved in herbicide response so that we can develop genetic assays that are um, specifically on those genes. And so I'll, I'll introduce you to that idea briefly at the end, and then I'll save, um, I'll, I'll save any details for later on. So real quickly, just to illustrate the concept of a catalog, um, this is a, a table that comes from some really nice work from a colleague of mine from a couple of years ago. Um, and what they did was they collected water milfoil from four different lakes. And you can, you might recognize this one at the top here. And they exposed, and those are all genetically different uh, strains of water milfoil. They exposed those different strains to three different herbicides, diquat, endothal, and 2,4-D. The columns underneath there are just the, the amount of time that they exposed them for, so I'm going to largely um, ignore that. And then they, they measured uh, the impact on plants one, two, and four weeks after, and I'm just focusing on the one week after treatment to just illustrate this for you. So I've highlighted the response to diquat for two different genotypes, and you can see that the response, so the numbers in here, I apologize, are percent um, growth of treated plants relative to untreated plants of the same genotype. So a value of 100 would mean that a treated, the treated genotype uh, grew just as well as the untreated genotype. And so for this particular herbicide, Diqua, if we look at these two different strains of water milfoil, we see that one of them uh, responded very well to the Diqua, that would be English Lake, and one didn't respond nearly as well, this Talamine Lake up here. If we look at 2,4-D, the pattern is switched. And so now uh, English Lake is relatively resistant to 2,4-D compared to the Townline Lake genotype uh, for, that, for that herbicide. And so you can imagine a catalog that has all these strains of water milfoil as rows and then their response to herbicides as columns. And so that, that's what we mean by a catalog. So, so you could uh, theoretically uh, go to a new lake, identify the genotypes that are there. If they're in the catalog, you could then look and see how they respond to these different herbicides and inform the management decisions that way. So uh, that's what we're doing in what I call the short term. It's, it's quite simple in concept. You just identify and prioritize genotypes or strains to characterize and then characterize them. Uh, there's a lot of uh, devils in, in the devils in the details of a lot of that. I'll, I'll leave a lot of this stuff out and just kind of illustrate the concepts for you today with some data. But um, next Wednesday and Thursday, if you join our additional sessions that we're going to have, we can talk about some of the uh, nuts and bolts with with this stuff to, on, the, on the logistical side. And I think that would be an interesting conversation uh, to have. So what I'm gonna do for the next several slides is, is illustrate for you how uh, we're going about identifying and prioritizing genotypes to characterize. The first way to do it is to just look and see which genotypes are most widespread across the landscape. Because those that are most widespread, if we characterize them, we have information about a collection of lakes that way. So on the right-hand side here is um, a, just a, a subset of lakes that I've worked on in Michigan. Uh, the different pin colors uh, correspond to different strains of water milfoil. And uh, so lakes that have the same pin color share uh, the strain of water milfoil. And so I'll draw your attention to the one in pink here, which is in about 10 different lakes. And that's a pretty, pretty high fraction of the lakes um, that we surveyed. We surveyed 60 lakes or so. Um, on the left hand side now is an illustration of an herbicide um, response assay that we do. So this happens to be for fluoridone and each box here is a different, is a different um, accession of water milfoil that was collected from a different lake. And so uh, in some cases, so the different strains you can think about them as, in some cases we collected the same strains from different lakes. On the y-axis is the biomass of plants that we harvested at the end of the experiment. On the left-hand side of each panel, on, above the C here, this point, is the average biomass of plants that were not treated. And then above this T here on the right-hand side is the average biomass of treated plants. And then we've just drawn a line connecting those so you can see how steep that line is. So generally, the steeper the line, uh, the more sensitive the genotype is to fluoridone. 
So, and, and these, these, this experiment was done at six parts per billion fluoridone for about two months, uh, which, is, which is a pretty typical um, fluoridone treatment in uh, Michigan. They're all done at six parts per billion and they're, they're done for two to three months at a time. So um, I'll draw your attention to this pink shaded box. That is the strain that's in these 10 or so different lakes. Um, and this is a fluoridone resistant genotype. So we really have very little impact of six parts per billion fluoridone on this particular genotype. And so what that means is that when we find this genotype in different lakes, uh, I would argue that fluoridone is not the best control tactic for that genotype. And in fact, we isolated that same strain from several other lakes, all these ones that say MG237. And in each case, they were resistant to fluoridone, which just kind of further proved the, the point that when we see the same genotype in different lakes, uh, we can expect it to respond the same way. Uh, every coin has two sides, so that's kind of the, 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 the negative side of identifying herbicide resistance, uh, but we can use this same approach to identify herbicide sensitive genotypes as well. And so this is the same figure on the left that I showed you before. This is a different set of genotypes now, and I'll draw your attention to these four lakes that have this uh, green pin, so that, indicating that they all have that same strain of water milfoil in those four lakes. And this is that strain right there. And so this strain is very sensitive to fluoridone. These are the untreated plants and the biomass is significantly and substantially lower for treated plants. And so what that means is when we see this, this particular genotype in, uh, in a new lake that, that we could be reasonably confident that fluoridone would be a good um, control tactic in that lake. And so um, that's just populating sort of the fluoridone um, column in this in this uh, hypothetical um, catalog that we're making, uh, but you know, we're, we're starting to build a catalog of genotypes that occur in multiple lakes. So then looking at that in Minnesota really briefly, I mean, Ray already showed these figures, so I won't go into them in too detail, but we, we have some ideas of genotypes that we would like to get that information for in Minnesota. So we have this very widespread Eurasian water milfoil, right? So if we know something about this strain, we know something about a lot of different lakes in Minnesota. Um, this particular hybrid genotype with the kind of bullseye um, icon here occurs in you know, eight, nine, 10 lakes. And so I think prioritizing that one makes sense. Um, and then prioritizing this one in Minnetonka makes sense as well. And I'll show you a little bit more uh, why that is in a second. So that's one way that we can prioritize genotypes just by collecting and harvesting genetic information from a variety of lakes across the state. Another way to do it is to follow individual lakes over time and get field estimates of how sensitive to particular herbicide treatments are um, for a particular genotypes. So essentially using the actual operational herbicide treatment in the field as our experiment to get estimates of herbicide sensitivity. So this is um, North Arm Bay in Lake Minnetonka. This was treated, it's been treated a number of times that this was treated with an oxygen herbicide in uh, June in 2015. And we went out and did pre-treatment, um, a pre-treatment survey, which would be typical to do for an herbicide treatment, mapping where the plants are and how abundant they are. But we added to that um, genetic information. So we identified different strains of water milfoil in North Arm Bay pre-treatment. And then we came back uh, post-treatment and did the same thing. And I'll draw your attention to, so the, the bars down here are just the relative frequencies of the different strains of water milfoil that were found pre and post treatment. And what we found in North Arm Bay in 2015 was that this, this yellow genotype here increased its relative, its relative frequency of occurrence pre versus post treatment. And what that means is just that it, it had, there was a relatively lower effect estimated on that genotype or that strain than on the other strains present in the lake. And so there's a number of alternative explanations, alternative hypotheses to explain that pattern. But one logical hypothesis is that that particular strain was not as susceptible to that particular herbicide treatment. And so that would, that would be an, a, a, a signature that we would be looking for to prioritize a genotype um, for laboratory, more, more focused experimental laboratory study. Um, just really quickly to, to, to compel you more on this particular genotype, I'll show you also the same kind of data from St. Albans Bay in 2015 which treated a very similar way. That genotype, that yellow genotype was at relatively low frequency pre-treatment 
uh, and it, the lake was dominated by actually that widespread Eurasian water milfoil genotype. That herbicide treatment worked really well, um, and there was hardly any water milfoil left over towards the late summer, uh, but the, the very few plants that we did find in the lake uh, or in the bay afterwards were that yellow genotype. And so again, it's a small number of plants, right? The overall control was really good, but proportionally we see this yellow genotype has increased in, um, in frequency. And so that just is further, um, further compels me to want to learn more about that particular genotype. And then the good news is, you know, we probably have some good idea that, that this particular strain is very sensitive to um, that oxenic herbicide treatment since we saw it essentially go away in that bay after treatment. So that's a second way we can prioritize genotypes for study because we can't study them all, or at least not all at once. The final way that I want to emphasize is just talking with um, managers that, that share their experiences. So um, I got a call at the end of uh, last summer from a manager in Michigan. I won't say who and I won't say what lake, but um, they were sort of, you know, kind of, you know, sort of speaking softly and saying, you know, I don't really want to tell you this, but I did this blurred on um, treatment and it really did not work very well at all. I mean, I, I know what they should look like um, and I was, and they usually work really well and this one just did not go uh, well at all. And so he sent me some of the plants um, and we, we, we then did some work on them and did a uh, flirt, uh, did a flirt on experiment in the lab. And this is that genotype right there collected from that lake. So again, treated, untreated plants, treated plants. And so fluoridone, did, we expect this to go down instead it actually went up, which is interesting. We can talk about, if anybody's curious about that, but um, actually grew better in the presence of fluoridone. And so that's a, 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 you know, a confirmation that that particular genotype is resistant to fluoridone. And so as we see that genotype in other lakes, uh, again, we would make the, the argument that uh, fluoridone would not be the best choice. And so I share this sort of vignette with you because, um, you know, it's the managers that are really out on the water and seeing all of this. I mean, you know, there's hundreds to thousands of lakes across the upper Midwest um, that people have some really good, good sense on. And so sharing that information when people are comfortable doing it is really one of the best ways that we can find um, these, these kinds of um, problematic genotypes. So uh, it, it really quick in summary for this, I'll, I'll just say you know, we can take the, 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 the tools that we already use to survey vegetation pre and post treatment. If we add genetic data collection to that, then we have this centralized repository of genetic information that we can use. When we come across genotypes that we've seen before, we can use that information to directly influence lake management planning uh, or possibly permitting. Um, or if we have a genotype that we haven't seen before, uh, we can use some of these sort of field signatures that I presented to you to determine whether or not we want to add that one on a, a list for prioritization um, for characterizing. There are caveats and limitations to all of this. I'll save that for Q&A and, um, and for next week. Just as a scientist, I feel like it's important that I uh, be clear or at least recognize the caveats and limitations. So um, there's some in interesting discussion topics here for people that are interested. But um, in my last few seconds here, what I'll do is just talk to you about briefly the concept of this long-term um, strategy to predict herbicide response with molecular markers. I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, with 23andMe or Ancestry.com. You know, you can swab your cheek and send in your, your swab and they extract DNA from that. And um, every individual except for, with the exception of identical twins, which in the Twin Cities you guys know a lot about, uh, but every other individual is unique. That means there, there's no individual, no two individuals have the same combination of all DNA, again, with the exception of identical twins. And so, um, and written in that code are all kinds of things about our traits, um, health predisposition, you know, whether or not, you know, what your chances of developing a certain health condition are, um, whether or not you're a carrier that might possibly um, pass an inherited condition to um, your offspring, even things like your probability of depression or alcoholism, um, those things are, there are all sort of signatures of that. They're not perfect signatures, but they're signatures of that um, in our DNA. And the Human Genome Project has really, over the last couple of decades, has really created a wealth of information um, where we can, we can get genome information from individuals and then be able to predict a lot of things about those individuals, again, with some error. Um, but but with, with, with surprising accuracy. And so the long-term approach is to be able to do that with specific um, 
specifically on herbicide response. And what that would do is would mean every time we see a new genotype, we wouldn't necessarily have to do an experiment on that genotype to characterize it. We could predict its response based on um, its DNA sequences. And so there's three main steps to doing that. I won't go into them. I have some backup slides if people are interested. And I can also go into that on Wednesday and Thursday. But I'll leave it at that for now. Um, I'll end here with just some acknowledgments. Obviously, there's a lot of people and a lot of money that goes into this stuff. Um, certainly, the Environment Natural, Natural Resources Trust Fund from Minnesota has been a big part of all of this work um, and some similar institutions from agencies from Michigan and some of the work that I showed you. Are a large number of people that are collecting plants and consulting with us on information um, and then, and then a, 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 a good group of people helping out in the field and the lab. And I'll give a special shout out on the herbicide screens to Greg Chorak, who's one of my um, students who's really doing a lot of great work on specifically on Florida. And so he deserves special mention. With that, I will um, open it up to questions. However, we deal with that for both Ray and I. And also thank you all for, for joining and giving me the opportunity to speak to you today about this. So thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Ryan and Ray. We really appreciate you taking your time to share your work with us. I'm just going to switch screens over here so that we can show the instructions again. And let's see. Okay. Sorry, I have children bursting into the webinar room. <laughs> um, so you are all muted right now. Um, you can use the chat feature in your webinar um, and you can type your questions in there. We've had some come in already and those um, We've been recording those. So we'll, I'll start asking those. If you have any tech issues again, you can ask Pat Mulcahy in chat. Um, and I'm just going to start working our way through the questions. Um, so one of the first questions I have is um, if hybrid water milfoil plants are able to grow in deeper water than um, other milfoils, um, native or invasive. So at least from our work, we haven't fully analyzed uh, localized uh, lake responses. Certainly it grows deeper than northern water milfoil, which does tend to be restricted to more shallow water. Um, but we don't have any good evidence at the moment that hybrids uh, pushing out uh, deeper and it may end up being somewhat intermediate, but we need to do more analysis on that. Thank you. Um, and is there any evidence if certain hybrid genotypes um, might be able to uh, persist in environments outside of what might be a, a traditional range um, from their native range? I mean, I guess I'd, I'd say from Minnesota and I think from the work in uh, elsewhere is we're not seeing it's showing up in like unique lakes that wouldn't be able to support uh, either uh, the native northern or uh, Eurasian water milfoil. I don't know whether Ryan has any observations on that also. But. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's great um, data on that. It, it's certainly possible. Um, one, of the, one of the sort of interesting things that hybridization in plants is sort of famous for is uh, generating uh, unique genotypes that are capable of occurring in environments that neither uh, that neither parent is particularly well suited for. Uh, whether or not that happens for Eurasian water Eurasian hybrid water milkwell uh, is is unclear um, right now. I I suppose I you know I, I would say um, if we think about herbicide resistance as um, being a, a novel environment, you know, being able to tolerate herbicides. Uh, as being a novel environment, then um, it, it's not necessarily true that there are no northern or Eurasian parents that are able to do that, but it does seem like it's more likely to be found in hybrids. And so that might be a, a case where um, that's true. But th that, that's sort of, you know, more sort of waxing on that than there are really um, hard data in terms of the environmental envelopes for parents versus hybrids. Great. Um, and then do you have any uh, guidance for people who are doing early detection work on distinguishing between northern water milfoil and hybrid water milfoil, especially um, without, if, if there's a way to do that without the genetic test or when you might suggest that they, um, they submit a sample for genetic testing to decide if it might be northern versus the hybrid? Yeah, 
I, I guess I'll take that one, Ray. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I would say that genetic testing is the best way to, to do that. Ray showed the figure earlier. Um, there's a lot of overlap between hybrid morphology and parent morphology. And so um, if, if it was important in the lake to distinguish native northern from hybrid, and I suspect in most lakes that it would, um, it would be best to do genetic testing. And um, you could work with somebody like myself to, and, or, or Ray to figure out sort of maybe the scope and scale of that testing. Um, certainly, it, you know, it, it's not easy for everybody to, to do, but through consultation, um, you know, you might get, um, you know, a, 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 a good strategy for how to, to do that. Great. And uh, we have a few questions coming in now about testing and the availability of, of genetic testing. Do you have um, thoughts or guidance for those, um, especially for uh, lake managers who, who are looking to do, to do treatments on um, where and how they might be able to get that testing done and, and what they can do with that information once they, they have the results? Ray, do you want to go first or you want me to? Oh, I guess I'll let you chime in on that. That's, <laughs> um, that's one of the things we're going to be meeting about a bit, but. So, yeah, I think, I think we'll be, we'll, we, we can talk a whole lot more about this Wednesday and Thursday. I'll, I'll share a few thoughts on it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think one should always do genetic testing, um, even if, and I'm, 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 I may be, I'm reading the chat on the side here too, so I don't know if I'm going to address the exact question that came in uh, from Megan or if, if I'm kind of bird walking around a little bit here. But, you know, even, even if you had a lake where the, the water milk oil wasn't particularly problematic, I think it would still be good to know what it is that you have. We, we do have um, cases in Michigan, for example, where um, a lake that has no management history and doesn't really have a, you know, it's not really a problem at the moment it, that, that the particular strain in those lakes are an herbicide resistant strain. And so I think it would be useful to know uh, where those strains are because they are obviously a, a source of recolonization potentially for um, other lakes. And so we don't really know why a given genotype is problematic in this lake and not in that lake. Um, but I, I would argue that you know, you would want to know just a, a basic description of what you have, even if there was no immediate plans to, um, to, to manage it. And again, the sort of scale and scope of that testing, I think is something, you know, to work with, um, you know, a consultant on or, um, you know, or a, a DNR specialist or somebody like Ray or myself, I think we can, you know, on a case by case basis, help people figure out, you know, what, what they, what they might, what their options might be. I'll just may jump in and mention too that um, <clears throat> in the past, like three or four or five years ago, um, you know, the tests were sort of set up fairly quickly to just identify whether you have hybrid versus Eurasian sort of taxon identification. Um, but probably increasingly we're realizing that it's sort of like most useful to really know what genotype it is because just knowing whether it's hybrid versus Eurasian isn't really telling you a lot. So, you know, that's something that sort of complicates the issue a bit more if we end up going into the genotyping uh, identification. But that's, I don't know, Ryan may, may not totally agree with me, but I think that's really where we get the, the useful information is knowing the genotype. No, I, I completely agree with you. <laughs> thanks, thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> Great, and is there information available about what the cost for the genetic testing is? So um, that for when, when my lab does it, it depends on the scale. Um, usually to just distinguish Eurasian versus hybrid, I mean, you don't, don't hold me to these numbers. They, they kind of, they, they change um, over time depending upon, you know, depending upon a number of factors, but to typically to determine Eurasian versus hybrid, um, well, or to do anything, it's usually about $50 a plant is what we usually charge. Um, if we're doing a large number of plants, that cost can go down because we have some economy of scale um, for larger numbers of samples. But I think a good rule of thumb is to, to plan on sort of $50 per sample. Um, but again, I mean, you know, that would be kind of case by case basis. And so talking to Ray or myself or a consultant, um, you know, can, can, can be helpful. <laughs> 
Great. Um, and I have one more testing question for now and uh, uh, looking for some additional guidance on when to test, especially if it's a lake that has known a uh, known Eurasian water milfoil population. Um, would you recommend testing um, just due to its presence or would it be more beneficial to, to only move towards testing if it seems as though it's more difficult to manage? Yeah, I, I, think, I think in both cases you would want to do testing. Um, I think the scale at which I would do testing would differ in those two cases. So um, if, if it's a lake where the water milfoil doesn't seem to be a problem, but it's known to be, you know, Eurasian or hybrid water milfoil are strongly suspected, um, you know, probably I, I would maybe do a smaller scale um, testing on that lake just to kind of, as Ray mentioned, is there what genotype is there um, to confirm it as Eurasian or hybrid. Um, and then, but if, if it was a problem, um, and there was going to be a, 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 an actual management program, that's, that's something where I would want to work with somebody to think about a, maybe a larger set, um, scale of testing. And again, that's something we could probably dive into more details into on Wednesday or Thursday through hypothetical examples, um, but that's my general thoughts on it at the moment. Okay. Um, and I have a couple more questions then going back to some of the more biology and ecology sides of things. Um, are, are the hybrids um, just as successful in reproducing uh, sexually compared to with the northern water milfoil? Yeah, I mean, Ryan can probably address this also, but it, it looks like the, the hybrid is fairly, I wouldn't say it's more successful than, than the native. So the native, again, there's all that diversity, although that's from a long time. I think probably the flip striking thing is that Eurasian doesn't seem to be real uh, effective at uh, reproducing sexually, but. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, you know, the, the, the data that we have are on sort of descriptions of diversity and Northern water milfoil certainly has the most, the highest genetic diversity, which indicates that, you know, it, that of the genotypes that are out there, there's a higher fraction of them that have been formed through, um, of the plants that are out there, a higher fraction of them that have been formed through sexual reproduction relative to hybrids or Eurasian water milfoil. Ray brings up a really good point, which is the time scale for that. So Northern water milfoil is native to the continent, has been around for thousands of years. And so there's been a lot of time for diversity to build up, if you will, whereas for hybrids, you know, there hasn't been nearly the same amount of time. So it's hard to say uh, really which are more prolific. I, I, I do think, and uh, you know, Dan, Dan Larkin's lab probably has some really good data on this. My sense is um, that, that hybrid water milfoil do tend to be a little bit more prolific at flowering, you flower a little earlier, flower a little later. Um, and so there's probably a higher potential for sexual reproduction in them, uh, but that said, they seem to be pre predominantly, you know, most of the biomass in, in any given lake, uh, it tends to be from asexual reproduction, which just is a, you know, just a, a, a testament, if you will, to their uh, really good ability to, to grow indeterminately and vegetatively propagate. Thank you. Um, and uh, I see uh, we have one person who has noticed hy hybrid water milfoil has been growing later in the season um, than other lakes that have presumed Eurasian um, or hybrid water milfoil. Um, do you think that might be a difference in how that genotype behaves? And is there a way, a way that that information can, can get used in um, mapping or treatment planning? I guess I'll take that one, Ray. Um, yep. So the, 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 the question was, um, can you can you use that that observation? Yeah, I mean, um, it it could be related to just that strain. Uh, that strain could be you know could have a phenology where it's a later flower or a later grower. Um, it could also be that it's just generally a, a, a you know that specific to that lake. Like it, it could be a nice match with the particular lake environment um, and the phenology, or it could be that that genotype is just really has a, a broad range of conditions that it can tolerate and so it may have a longer growing season um, than, than most other genotypes. To, to really tease that apart you'd have to you know either you'd have to do some comparisons between genotypes either in the lake um, or in the laboratory. Um, certainly 
it, it is a trait flowering time or, 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 you know, or length of growing season is a trait that you can map genetically if you have genotypes that vary in that. So let's say a late, late flower and an earlier flower, um, you, could, you could cross those two and then um, and do some genetic mapping for flowering time, let's say. Um, whether or not that would provide any actionable information for a manager would depend on the concern of the lake group and the manager in, in terms of um, yeah, phenology and, and, and how that might be impacting the lake. So I think that would be a, a case, you know, a kind of a case specific thing. All right. And um, have you noticed if there's a difference in the genotypes that are present across states, for example, in Michigan versus in Minnesota? Yes, there are. Um, I can send a link out to a paper that uh, Ray and several co-authors and I have, have recently published. Some of the co-authors I see are on the, on the uh, chat here, which is good. Um, yeah, there, there are generally differences between Michigan and Minnesota. So that widespread um, Eurasian water milfoil genotype that occurs in Minnesota also occurs in Michigan, but Michigan has relatively more diversity in pure Eurasian water milfoil than Minnesota does, which is interesting. And we're not sure if that's just sort of a historical artifact of when and you know when and where they were colonized from, or if that's you know something going on in terms of you know environment or management or whatnot. Um, they're, they're, they're fairly comparable in terms of hybrid water milfoil. They don't share any hybrid water milfoil genotypes that we've seen thus far. Um, the more we look, we may find that there are some that are shared. That probably indicates that, you know, hybrids are formed locally and tend to be, and tend to sort of have more restricted geographic distributions. And the, the flip side of that coin is that hybridization, hybrids are probably produced frequently um, in different places. And then northern water milfoil is really diverse, uh, actually considerably more diverse in Minnesota than in Michigan, which is another interesting sort of observation. Um, uh, but, th but we haven't seen really genotypes shared um, across for northern water milfoil either. All right, thanks, Ryan. Um, I think with that, we're going to wrap up. There's three minutes left, so I think I'll use that time to give our closing words. I know there's a couple of questions that we haven't had a chance to get to yet, and um, I apologize to those of you if we haven't been able to answer those. Um, Ray and Ryan have said that they'd be able to provide answers to those questions um, in writing afterwards. So once we uh, have this, um, recording closed captioned, we'll, we'll have a document alongside that with the answers to the questions that we weren't able to answer live. And, and we can certainly have the transcripts for the questions that were answered live um, available as well alongside that. Um, so with that, I'm going to thank everyone for coming, um, especially Ray and Ryan. Thanks to both of you again for sharing your expertise with us. Um, on the slide showing now, you can see so a, couple, a little bit more information. The uh, emails for both of our presenters is available there. So if you have questions about um, the content that you saw or a follow-up question, you can feel free to reach out to them there. If you have a question for us as the webinar hosts about the webinars or um, other parts of our program, our email is showing on there as well. That's aisdetectors at umn.edu. And we'd be happy to answer any of your questions um, regarding the, the webinar series as a whole there. Um, we did record this session. So if you would like to check back on the recording, um, that will go on to our YouTube channel. Um, you can subscribe to that as well if you'd like, and then YouTube should send notifications when we post new videos. Uh, you can get to our channel by going to z.umn.edu slash AISTube. Uh, and again, it takes about a week to get the closed captioning and, and question and answers back, um, keeping in mind that it's a long weekend. So it may be it may be the week following that this gets up. But we do it as quickly as we can with, with the turnaround. Um, so again, I will, I will leave it at that. Thanks again for, to everyone for joining and have a great weekend. Thank you for hosting us. Yeah, thanks everybody.